Okay. This conference will now be recorded. Okay. So this is the talk article from the July issue 2020. And this is syphilis in pregnancy. What is new in it? We already had a BASH guideline 2015, which we were reading till now. What is new in this talk? Why this talk? Because actually the syphilis, uh, syphilis was really, congenital syphilis was really eliminated from the UK according to the WHO criteria but of late in the last few years new cases have again searched up for the congenital syphilis so uh, what they have seen is that at the initial booking even if the patient is negative still in the uh, ongoing pregnancy when if she gets an infection the transmission rate is very high to the fetus and so they got some cases of the congenital syphilis in the patients who were tested negative at the screening. So the main purpose of this talk is to highlight that the antenatal screening and proper management of syphilis in pregnancy is very important to decrease the incident of congenital syphilis. Fine. So to decrease the incidence of congenital syphilis, we need two things. We should screen the patients and if they are positive, they should be adequately treated. Now, what is the problem with the screening? We are already doing the universal screening for syphilis in UK. Then why this problem? The problem is that once you screen at the booking, it's fine if the patient is negative, then no further screening is done. But it is important, this talk basically highlights that you have to keep following the patients in a high risk group, high risk for developing syphilis in pregnancy. So in those patients, you have to follow them with the repeat testing so that you don't miss the patients who develop the syphilis during the course of pregnancy so that you reduce the incidence of the congenital syphilis. If you detect them, you will be able to treat them and so congenital syphilis will be less. So main thing, the main crux of bringing up this new talk article after the last PASH guideline is that you basically have to see how to screen the patients how to diagnose and how to properly screen the high-risk patients. For this, you need to know what are the high-risk groups and how to do the screening in these patients. Okay, so syphilis is a bacterial sexually transmitted infection caused by the Crepinoma pallidum, and it remains the most common congenital infection worldwide. Globally, syphilis remains prevalent in Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, and Eastern Europe. Why this? Um, I have marked these places in red because RCOG is a very, very have much this habit that they will not directly mention uh, the thing, uh, the diagnosis, but they will say that the patient came from this area and presented with this this clinical symptoms okay so to uh, i think somebody's mic is on so it would be good if you all can keep your mic on mute when i ask the question then definitely you can switch on your mic and speak okay so uh, uh, taking into account this places that, like africa south america these this is important to remember because when they ask the question they'll tell you the patient came from the africa or she was in contact with a partner uh, who who was african and he has just came, come from the africa and all these things so uh, so it is important to know the endemic places of a particular infection if you are studying any infection you need to know because that correlation will help you in exam when you see uh, the patient clinical scenario okay so this is also one very important point Syphilis is the leading infective cause of stillbirth in countries in which it is endemic. What are the risk factors for syphilis in pregnancy? Anyone would like to answer? Okay, so risk factors for the syphilis in the pregnancy are low socioeconomic status, 
multiparity history of STIs, use of illicit drugs before the age of 18 years, and illicit drug use by the current partner, poor engagement with antenatal care, that is patient is not regular with her antenatal care visits, she has come for the late booking, or she is not following the appointments regularly, three or more sexual partners in the previous 12 months. So whenever you see in syphilis for the exam point of view, you have to remember the these factors because if you see these factors in your exam scenario, you have to choose the repeat screening again after screening at the booking. So it is important to remember the risk factors for syphilis in pregnancy. So take care. This poor engagement with the antenatal care actually you will see as a high risk factor in many, many different scenarios because it's, uh, it signifies that there is something patient is vulnerable to some type of violence or some type of sexual activity, abnormal, uh, some type of thing which is not uh, actually allowing her to take her regular visits. So, so this is one very high risk factor which you can easily forget. So please remember this and it is very much favorite of RCOG. So late booking a patient, if something like is mentioned that patient is not regularly coming to the visits, so uh, she is not um, regular with her follow up, not doing the investigations at right time. So take care, this is an important point to take care of. Then what about the modes of transmission? Modes of transmission, transmission is mostly via the sexual contact, but remember only one third of the individuals exposed to the disease will become infected. So only one third will become infected. Bacteria can also enter extra genitally. That is why you can have other lesions. Transmission can also occur transplacentally during any stage of pregnancy. The risk of transmission is dependent on the stage of maternal infection and duration of fetal exposure. So stages of syphilis, we divide them as primary, secondary, latent and tertiary. First primary, then it comes the secondary and then it goes to the latent phase, which can be either the early latent if the lesion comes back in less than one year. If it is more than one year, then it is the late latent. And finally, long, long, long after 20 years, 30 years, you can get the symptoms. So there, that will be the tertiary syphilis where other organs are also involved. About the primary syphilis. Approximately three weeks following exposure to the infection, range could be nine to 90 days. So you can remember as three weeks to three months. A single papule at the site at which the bacteria enter the body becomes a shanker. What is the characteristic thing which you will get in exam scenario? What are the keywords would be the painless and indurated non-purulent lesion? These are the keywords for the syphilitic lesion. Whenever you see an exam, the syphilitic lesion scenario, you will see these words there. Painless, indurated, and non-purulent lesion. If outside the genital tract, shankers can be multiple and painful. But for you, remember in exam, you will see these words. Painless, indurated, and non-purulent. Shankers typically heal spontaneously over three to eight weeks, but in 25% of the patients, this will go on to develop the secondary syphilis if they do not receive treatment at this stage. So one fourth will go and progress to the secondary syphilis. Secondary syphilis often emerge four to 10 weeks after the development of the primary shanker. And then there could be the uh, generalized features like malaise, flu-like symptoms such as loss of appetite, lymphadenopathy, or there may be generalized mucocutaneous rash. So mucocutaneous means with the mucous membrane and also the cutaneous skin. So mucous membranes will be affected and also the palms and the soles. Then periana condylometalata, they are basically the discolored, warty, highly infectious lesions. So they can be present. 
other signs such as meningitis, eye disease, hepatitis, glomerulonephritis, and splenomegaly can be seen. Now, what about the secondary syphilis? How it goes further? So, most of the lesions resolve between one to three months. But 25, in 25% of the cases, they have recurrence in the early latent period. That is, in, within the one year, 25% cases will have a recurrent secondary lesion again. So this is the natural course. If not, patient is not treated. 30% will progress to tertiary late latent period. So 30% will go on carrying the bacteria for the longer time and then not presenting any symptoms for a long time, maybe up to 20 years, 30 years or 40 years. And at that time, they will present with the symptoms of the tertiary syphilis. So these figures are important to remember. 25% recurrence in early latent and 30% will progress to the tertiary if it is not treated. And these two things are very important to remember in secondary. One is the mucocutaneous rash and other is the condylometer latter. Now, something specific about in pregnancy. From 14 weeks onward, the bacteria can cross the placenta and cause the fetal infection. Fetal loss is common with the demise of 30 to 40 percent of fetuses infected during the pregnancy. So it's a big figure. 30 to 40 percent of the fetuses will die during the pregnancy. What are the causes for this fetal loss? One is the placental infection and other is the compromised blood flow to the fetus. Of the fetuses that survive, one third will be born with the signs of congenital syphilis. So you will see in one third at the birth signs of congenital syphilis and remaining will, have, will come up later in few weeks or maybe up to the two years. So we'll, we'll discuss this when we go on to the congenital syphilis. So it is one third who will show the signs of congenital syphilis at birth. Transmission rate predominantly depends on the stage of the disease and obviously on the gestation period also. So primary, if it is a primary syphilis, uh, so it is transmission rate is up to 100%. So now this is one, this is important factor. Why we are discussing this talk article? Because we want to emphasize that repeat screening in pregnancy is needed if a patient is a high risk. Because if she develops the primary syphilis first time in her pregnancy, the transmission rate is up to 100%. So it becomes very important if we want to eliminate the incidence of transgenital syphilis, we have to take into account that our patients if they uh, get infected with syphilis during the pregnancy, during course of pregnancy, they should be screened and treated um, appropriately. Because in that case only, we'll be able to bring down the incidence of congenital syphilis. So this is important, most important part. Remember with primary syphilis, transmission rate can be up to 100%. Early latent fate, it is 40% and late latent, it is further less, that is up to the 10%. What are the features of the fetal infection? Fetal infection is initially characterized by placental involvement and hepatic dysfunction. So basically, this uh, syphilis does not have any much uh, fetal features which are different from the other infections. They are more or less same as with the other infections like the viral and the other ones. So fetal growth restriction, hepatomegaly, thrombocytopenia, anemia, and ascites can be there, which is very common with the other inf congenital infections as such. So risk of preterm birth, stillbirth, and neonatal death. Fetal demise at any stage, it could be preterm, risk, stillbirth, or neonatal death. Common fetal ultrasound features are ascites, hepatosplenomegaly, placentomegaly, and intrahepatic calcifications. Now, this is something very important, laboratory testing and diagnosis. So we have three types of methods. One is direct testing methods, then serological tests uh, for triponema pallidum, 
and non treponemal serological tests so what is the difference between the all direct testing is that you are taking a specimen and then you will try to see the organism in that smear so it can be either done by the dark field microscopy or you do the polymerase chain reaction with that so these tests have the benefit of detecting the bacteria before a serological response occurs because serological response takes some time but bacteria if you can demonstrate that is the earliest thing you can do to detect but these tests are not usually available uh, at all laboratories there are only certain reference laboratories where they are available so it is bit difficult so you are used for the screening purpose and definitely if you have don't have a lesion how can you screen uh, by the direct methods so for screening we need to have the serological tests only so serological tests such as enzyme immunoassays and t trypanema pallidum particle agglutination assays these are the tests which basic, basically detect the antibodies which are produced in response to the trypanemal proteins or to the non trypanemal antigens okay so anything like the damaged host cells or the lipoidal antigens are there which for which the antibodies are produced and these tests will detect so uh, because as you see that they also respond to the other antibodies which are from the damaged host cells or the other antigens or they may be cross sensitivity with the other trypanemal species so these tests show a good amount of false reactivity so just doing one simple testing with this test will not give you the confirmation that the, that the patient is having syphilis they can be positive with the other infections or inflammatory conditions like sle so that is why it is important that we have to confirm the diagnosis by the other test so what is recommended is that if you have done one type of assay like if you have done the enzyme immune assay then you can go on to the trypanemia pallidum particle agglutination assay or also that means that basically you have to so send the same sample for the other type of um, uh, serological testing so that two tests confirm that the patient has the syphilis the non trypanemal serological tests include the rapid plasma reagent test or venerable venereal disease research laboratory antigen test so these assays are basically they are or they also show the false positive results so they are not for the confirmation basically they are for to uh, assess the titer of the antibodies so igm igg antibodies titer you have to see because when you give the treatment then you have to see that the uh, titers are falling until the time it becomes negative so it is for the main purposes monitoring so rpr and vdrl are particularly the monitoring test and they are not for the screening or the diagnosis okay so uh, these tests can also give false positive tests so such as in yaws or in systemic inflammatory conditions such as endocarditis and even just even a pregnancy can give you the false positive test with this and you are doing the you want to screen the patients in pregnancy so you can see that these cannot be useful tests they are basically to see the titers so that you can monitor the treatment this is the flow chart which is recommended that is you have to do the trypanemal serology and see the igg and igm by the uh, this eia chemiluminescent assay or trypanema pallidum particle agglutination or trypanema pallidum heme agglutination test so you have to do the serology with these tests then if it is negative nothing to do the work is finished but if it is positive then you have to confirm either you send the same sample for the other type of serological test so send the original sample for the different type of test or you can take a same a second sample and do the same test either way you you need to have two confirmations 
before saying that your patient is positive for the syphilis. So two confirmations are needed. So, uh, then before starting the treatment, once your patient uh, comes out to be positive, you have to start the treatment. So now what two things you have to do, you have to do the now the VDRL or the RPR test because they are the quantitative test and you have to now see the titers of the antibody and before starting the treatment and then finally repeat it three monthly till it becomes to the low risk range. So this is the one which is very important to know. Secondly, you have to refer the patient to the gum clinic because she will be screened for the partner tracing and other uh, for other STIs and also her um, birth plan will be uh, performed according to the gum or the pediatric neonatal care. Together they will work in a multidisciplinary manner and formulate the birth plan for this patient. Now, once it is negative, then what? Then we have to offer the repeat screening. This, this part is very important and it is the crux of this dog article. Offer the repeat screening three monthly in the pregnancy. Consider this if women declined at booking or if you see there are high risk factors which put the patient in a high risk group, show that she has a continuous exposure of the high risk factors. So new or multiple sexual partners or she is a commercial sex worker, sexual contact with men, who has a sexual contact with men because syphilis is of now seen more commonly in men who have sex with men or the bisexual men okay so these that is why their incidence is now increasing sexual partner is from a country with a high prevalence like africa southeast asia or south america so now you know why i was highlighting the places because you need to know with every infection what is the main area, endemic area? Because that word you will usually see, that place you will usually see in the clinical exam scenarios. And that will help you define the answer. So it is very important to know the places. So these are the high risk things in which the you have to keep on doing the three monthly screening in the pregnancy. One thing is there that if at the booking you are doing the screening test for the syphilis but you think in the last three months or in uh, some time before that screening test she was uh, she had a exposure to any high risk factor like she had exposure to any new sexual partner or she had multiple sexual partners or she was already a sex worker so any high risk factor if you see at that time of booking you have to repeat the screening at six weeks and at 12 weeks because of the window period. Maybe your patient is affected in last act of intercourse and she is in a window period. And in uh, that time, if you screen, she shows that it is negative, but actually she was developing the infection. So for a high risk group, First time also, if you see that she was, she had a high risk factor, you have to screen at six weeks, 12 weeks. And at 12 weeks when she is negative, then you can do it every three monthly. Okay. So this is something which is new from the BASH guidelines in this talk article. Now about the treatment. Syphilis in pregnancy should be managed by the multidisciplinary team, which involves the genitourinary medicine physicians, neonatologists, and the microbiologist. Management should include the antimicrobial therapy. Definitely, patient has been tested for the syphilis positive, so she has to receive the treatment. So, antimicrobial therapy, then the counseling, partner notification, and safe sex advice. So, you have to Counsel the patient and uh, refer her to the gum clinic for the partner notification because you have to do the tracing of the partners. And if they come positive, they definitely have to be treated and safe sex advice for the further, um, like her further sexual life. So use of condoms, that is very important. So for this, you will have to refer her to the 
gum clinic and also if she is detected with the syphilis you have to rule out all other stis it's a rule if you uh, get detected any one sti you have to rule out all other stis so this you have to follow women should be treated as soon as the diagnosis is established preferably in just early gestation because the treatment should in, uh, be initiated at least 30 days before delivery because four weeks is needed to bring the adequate response so you have to have uh, start the treatment at least four weeks prior to delivery this is one very important factor which influences the risk of the congenital infection okay so this is important now antibiotics used are so first and second trimester a drug of choice is always menzathin penicillin 2.5 mega units im single dose so this is uh, first and second trimester but in the third trimester as i said because we want the at least four weeks period so in the last trimester is sometimes the patient may have early delivery so you need at least two doses weekly for two weeks to bring out the levels early uh, so 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 as to bring the effective levels earlier for the uh management okay so that is why for the third trimester you need two doses at a interval of the week one week then you have to repeat the injection again in the latent phase when the patient is in a latent late disease this first protocol is for the early disease by either either it is primary or it is secondary or it is early latent but if it is a late latent then you need three doses at interval of one one week so benzathine penicillin 2.4 million units im weekly for three weeks and this regimen is used in all stages of pregnancy so either it is first trimester it is second trimester or third trimester you will have to give the three doses so this is for the late latent disease now if the patient is reported to be uh, sensitive or allergic to penicillin then what because this is the drug of choice so what to do so we still want to go for the benzathine penicillin so uh, we have to basically send the patient to the allergy clinic first to see that whether she is really you have to confirm that she is really penicillin allergic or not so history taking is very important because you have to ask the patient what type of allergy was it so any type of mild moderate energy you can uh, again recheck but it, if it is like anaphylactic reaction was there then definitely it's for sure that the patient had a problem with the penicillin so in that case you have to first clearly define okay and then if she can tolerate the cephalosporins if she is not allergic to them then the second thing you can do to her is the ceftriaxone 500 milligram intramuscularly daily for 10 days so if if at all she you find that she is highly sensitive to penicillin but she can tolerate cephalosporin then this is the other protocol you can use now the other scenario which you can have your in your exam is if a patient is not penicillin allergic she is not allergic to penicillin but sometimes it is written patient cannot tolerate the intramuscular injection she does not want intramuscular injection she is not ready for it any such type of scenario if you get in the exam then your answer will be the alternative is amoxicillin 500 mg and probenicid 500 mg both orally four times per day for 14 days so this is something if your patient does not tolerate the intramuscular regime now the jarek schwarzheimer re reaction it can complicate up to 45 percent of syphilis treatments in pregnancy such a huge number so it is very important to know this so that is why whenever the dose of penicillin is given you have to keep the patient for observation for at least 15 minutes and all your emergency and resuscitative measures should be ready so that is why it is important 
Now, symptoms typically occur within the first 24 hours of treatment and include the fever, rigors, and skin rash. And in pregnancy, there are also case reports of uterine contractions. Now, because of the uterine contractions, there is a chance of preterm labor. So, if any Part 3 students are here, it will be important for them to remember that if you are advising the patient the penicillin, then patient safety is that you have to take the consent that she can deliver preterm. Okay. So this, this point is basically important for the part three students because they are counseling the patients. So they have to deal with the patient safety. So it occurs in 50% of cases of the primary syphilis as many as 90% of cases of the secondary syphilis. So remember not to get confused. It is higher chances of uh, this occurring is higher in secondary syphilis. So this is around 90%. When you are treating the primary syphilis, it is nearly 50%. And latent disease has a reaction rate of only 25%. Treatment is mainly with the fluids and symptomatic treatment is there. There is no specific treatment is there. Only thing you have to manage whatever symptoms are there. The, there are some studies which advocate that you can give uh, the paracetamol or the steroids before giving the penicillin, but this is not a recommendation by the RCOG. So no pre-medication can prevent this reaction and it is not evidence-based, so no pre-medication is used. Now a word about the congenital syphilis. So what is the WHO criteria for elimination of mother to child transmission of syphilis is less than 50 cases of congenital syphilis per one lakh. Okay, so this is uh, already UK has met this criteria, but why they are worried because recently they have seen the patients are in a high risk group and they acquire the infection during the pregnancy and they get the they show the symptoms of congenital syphilis at the birth. So basically to change that scenario, they are now advocating the repeat screening every three months in a high risk patients. Congenital syphilis is commonly dividing into early and LA disease depending on its time of presentation. Early disease manifests in the first two years of life, whereas the late congenital syphilis is apparent after the age of two years. Around two thirds of the babies with congenital syphilis are asymptomatic. Already we read that one third babies will present the symptoms at birth. And of those who, who are asymptomatic, the two thirds are asymptomatic. Out of those two thirds, two thirds will demonstrate the signs and symptoms from three to eight weeks of age. Congenital syphilis is a multi-system infection that can result in neonatal death and long-term disability. So in early disease, there could be skin rashes, stigmata of meningitis, hepatomegaly, and jaundice. Blood tests may show severe anemia, monocytosis, thrombocytopenia, deranged liver function, and raised alkaline phosphatase levels. X-rays may demonstrate the periostitis. Blood snuffles is a characteristic discharge from the nose which is because of the syphilitic rhinitis. So there is a pink colored nasal discharge, blood snuffles it is called as. Then something important is the Hutchinson stride. It is usually seen in the late disease and in late disease there is a typical bony deformities are also there because of the chronic inflammation. And in Hutchinson's triad, what is included is eighth cranial nerve deafness, interstitial keratitis and Hutchinson's teeth. That is the notched incisors. So this is the Hutchinson's triad and along with this the bony deformities you can see. Syphilitic rhinitis leads to the characteristic saddle nose and the anterior bowing of the mid tibia creates the classic saber shins. The impact of the late congenital disease can be devastating with one third to one quarter of children presenting over the age of two years having asymptomatic neurosyphilis. 
Babies born with the congenital syphilis are 10% more likely to die in the first year of life. That is why we are concerned about the congenital syphilis and we want to screen the antenatal patients appropriately. All of us are doing the universal screening, but we want to do the screening appropriately at intervals so that whatever there is a chance of catching the syphilis in the pregnancy that also is ruled out so this is about this org article uh, and i've just told also what is different from the bash guideline what is new in it so if you have any questions you are welcome else we will discuss the cpd questions Okay, so you now you will have to answer the CPD questions. Help me in solving these questions. So anybody is welcome to answer. So it, these are uh, for those new candidates which have joined first time for the part two session. I know there are few. So what are CPD questions? Whenever you have a talk, talk articles are there are general obstetrician and gynecologist general and issue is published every three months. So basically there are four talk articles in a year talk issues in a year and you have articles from that and in the end you have a true and false questions so it's good to solve the, those cpd questions because these are from the important points so now it is true and false so syphilis is seen equally and male and female individuals anybody can answer true or false yes seen equally in male and female individuals what? yes what's more in males yes it is false it is more in males as i already told you it is more with the bisexual men so it is more seen in the males very good the most common congenital infection worldwide true or false true true very good yes it's true not a part of the antenatal screening program false false we are doing the antenatal screening and it's a universal screening everybody is screened for it then risk factors for acquiring syphilis in pregnancy include three or more sexual partners in the last 12 months true true yes multiple sexual partners is a risk factors history of chlamydia true yes this is also true any history of uh, previous history of sti is a risk factor with regard to syphilis infection and pregnancy there is a 50 percent risk of transmission to the fetus in primary disease true um this is true it is 100 percent so oh. it is false it is uh, around up to 100 percent yes so it is false good transmission to the fetus is more likely if the disease is in the latent stage False. False. It's false. A false. Yes. False. In a primary disease, it's the highest one. Mm -hmm. So in latent, mm -hmm. it is best. Yes. In early latent, it is 40%, and in late latent, it is only 10%. So it is less in latent stage. 30 to 40% of the infected fetuses will die in utero. True. True. Yes. Very good. Mm -hmm. It's true. Signs of congenital disease are seen at birth in approximately one third of the babies who survive the pregnancy. False. False. True. It's, no, it's, it's true. two thirds. It's true. Very, yeah. No, two thirds are asymptomatic. This is one third. One yeah. third show the symptoms, uh, show the signs of congenital mm -hmm. disease. So one third are symptomatic and two thirds are asymptomatic. And uh, the two third which are asymptomatic, out of these, two third will show the symptoms in the next few weeks. So, with regard to serological tests for syphilis, the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory test does not illustrate the disease activity. It only shows its presence. True or false? True. 
फॉल्स टाइटल्स सो इट शोज द डिजीज एक्टिविटी बिकॉज वंस यू स्टार्ट ट्रीटिंग इट द टाइटल्स फॉल and you keep on doing the test three monthly till the title uh, go, comes down so you this is basically showing you the disease activity and here the it is that this does not show the disease activity so this statement is false it is not to screen it does not it is not for to show that the uh, trypanosoma is present it is not a screening test it is for the monitoring so it is for the disease activity so this is false inflammatory conditions such as sle that is systemic lupus erythematosus are known to cause false positive yes so, i already had the answer in the chat box yes it's true true yes right true when, yes correct this is absolutely true when there are significant risk factors for the infection repeat test should be sent at 6 and 12 weeks after the last sexual contact if the initial screening is negative Yes, good. Yes, true. anyone wants to answer on voice? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Mm. It's a uh, if if you see that the patient is from a high risk group, you expect that she can be positive. Then you have to repeat the test at six and twelve weeks. When using the benzathione penicillin to treat the syphilis in pregnancy, two doses are required to treat the primary disease after the first trimester. false false no oh, it's false yes false. it's false it's not true why it is not true because two doses are required only in the third trimester in first and second trimester you will give only single dose okay and here it says that two doses are required after first trimester so it means that in second trimester also you require two doses which is not correct in first and second trimester you require only one dose and in the third trimester there will be two doses that jarich hatsmira reaction is said to occur in up to 45% of the cases true or false true true yes. it's true. absolutely true. true yes good three doses are required when the patient has late stage disease regardless of trimester true, true. yes true in a late late latent you require three doses every time features in the hutchinson triad include sabershins it is is it a feature of hutchinson triad no no this is no. and this is false not in sizes yes true yes interstitial keratitis true no yes Yes, this is true. No. Internal interstitial keratitis is true. Uh, eight, eight cranial nerve deafness. True. Yes, true. true. Yes, saddle nose. False. Yes. So sixteen and twenty are false. Seventeen, eighteen, ninety are features of Hutchinson's trial. So this finishes our article. This one. So I think. you have understood it properly and everyone have answered the cpd question so beautifully so you will remember my purpose was that you show you just remember by hearing this talk article now if you remember this much points no need to go and read back it again and uh, this will be engraved in your mind this was my purpose and i think it has been solved and we'll keep on doing one one talk article every 2 3 days so that you don't waste your time on tog articles and you can spend more time on your guidelines and all your queries are welcome here and also in the group so you can always ask okay i'll again post the next time when we will do the next talk and thank you so much for joining thank you very much thank you welcome welcome your queries are always yes welcome